name is Melissa and I'm a fitness trainer. I am an overachiever. I am a loyal friend. I am compassionate. I set high goals for others. I am a wife. I am a sister. I am a daughter. My name is Melissa. I am an overcomer. All right, so we're talking about who I am, who do you think you are, and today it's talking about how we are overcomers, and we will get to that and we will develop that as best we can, but um, uh, it's good to be able to open scripture together, it's good to know who I am in Christ, not what somebody else says about me, but what does God say, and that's really what we want to go after, and so we're going to be in several places today. We'll be in Romans 8, we'll be in 2 Corinthians 2, so go where you'd like. Most of the scriptures will be up on the screen, but love you to open your Bibles or open your device or whatever. Uh, you know, Romans 8, verse 37, is sort of a springboard for where we're going. And this is what it says. It says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. That word is nikeo. If you guys are wearing tennis shoes right now, you might have some Nikeos on right now. They're better translated Nike right now. But the word Nikeo or Nike is the god of victory. They worshiped victory in the Greek and Roman days. And so when you hear that word conqueror, think of Nikeo, think of just do it, think of Michael Jordan and all those championships that the Bulls won, all right? Uh, sorry, I digress. Um, but it means to conquer, to prevail, to carry off the victory, to come out victorious. And scripture says, those who are in Jesus Christ, those who have trusted him for their salvation, we are overcomers. We're more than conquerors. This is who you are. And I know that to be true, but if you're like me, I don't always feel it to be true. I don't always believe it to be true because of what my circumstances are. And when I read that scripture, a lot of times, and maybe I'm speaking to you this morning, what you see is not more than conquerors, but you see in all these things. Oh, my life's a mess. You don't understand. You don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what I'm dealing with. All of these things are making me very weary. All of these things are causing me to be depressed. They're bringing me down. This isn't such an easy life. And I don't feel very victorious. And I don't feel like an overcomer. Well, I want to talk to you today because I know we all get to that point. I know that we all feel that way. Max Licato, probably one of my favorite authors, wrote in a book called On the Anvil. Uh, I think in the second or third chapter, he tells this story that I think always illustrates the point to me. This is what he writes. He says, it will, rem it will be remembered always as one of the most confounding missing persons cases. In August of 1930, 45-year-old Joseph Crater waved goodbye to his friends after an evening meal in a New York City restaurant. He flagged down a taxi and rode off, and he was never heard of or seen from again. 80 years of research has offered countless theories, but no conclusions. Since Crater was a successful New York City Supreme Court judge, many have suspected murder but a solid lead has never been found. Other options have been presented, kidnapping, mafia involvement, even suicide. A search of his apartment revealed one clue. It was a note attached to a check and both were left for his wife. The check was for a sizable amount and the note simply read, I am very weary. I am very weary. Love, Joe. The note could have been nothing more than a thought at the end of a day, or it could have meant a great deal more. The epitaph of a de despairing man. Weariness is tough. I don't mean the physical weariness that comes from mowing the lawn or the mental weariness that follows a hard day of decision-making and thinking. 
No, the weariness that attacked Judge Crater is much worse. It's the, it's the, it's the weariness that comes just before you give up. The feeling that, that, that's of honest desperation. It's the dispirited father, the abandoned child, or the retiree with time on his hands. It's the stage in life when motivation disappears. The children grow up, a job is lost, a wife dies, and the result is weariness. Deep, lonely, frustrating weariness. For our thoughts today, perhaps you're right there. Well, guess what? You are in good company. You are not alone. One of my heroes in the faith felt just like you and maybe even more of an extreme. His name is Paul. You know him as the Apostle Paul. And you may even think me sacrilegious for saying something derogatory about the Apostle Paul, but I've got even better news. He said it about himself. He unashamedly said, there were times in my life that I felt like giving up, like I felt in absolute despair. He even wrote in a letter to the Corinthians, and we'll spend some time there, but not in this particular passage. He said to them in 2 Corinthians 1.8, listen to what he says about himself. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, of the afflictions we experienced. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. The great apostle who wrote most of the New Testament, at least half of it, is saying to his church, I felt like dying. I was miserable and it was hard. And we find in scripture an actual occasion where this was brought to the light. It's really phenomenal that, you know, this week I think God brought me to this passage that I've read before, but I I didn't really see the impact of it until I just let it sort of wash over me. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. He's writing to this church, and this is what he said. And and you're going to read that and think, I don't see anything in there. Well, let me just pick it apart for you. It says this, When I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was opened for me in the Lord, my spirit was not at rest because I didn't find my brother Titus there. So I took leave of them and went to Macedonia. Powerful, right? You're going, no. Well, let me explain what's going on. So the Apostle Paul started this church in Corinth. He gave almost two years of his life to these people. He loved them deeply. And you know, when you love somebody deeply, that's the only time that you can really experience great pain in that relationship. He loved these guys so much. But when he left, almost immediately... Sin just entered into this congregation. This is about the most dysfunctional congregation I've ever heard about. You think we got problems? (laughs) We got no problems compared to them. I mean, they were so messed up. They were divided. They were disorderly. They were worldly. Chaos reigned in their worship. Sin stained the Lord's Supper. People would come to the Lord's Supper and overindulge. They would eat so much and drink so much that they would be gluttons and drunks at the Lord's Supper. And other people would be hungry and nobody shared with them. They were so messed up. They fought each other. They sued each other. They sexually sinned with each other. And they were proud of it. We love in this church. Yes, they do. Way too much. Way inappropriately. But they celebrated these sinful conditions. I mean, it got so bad that Paul tried to send Apollos back to Corinth. And Apollos refused to go. He's like, I am not going back there. Those people are messed up. On top of that, almost as soon as Paul leaves... False teachers follow him. And they're teaching a doctrine of devils. They're teaching something that is so unbiblical, uh, but they convinced the people and there was this almost 
complete mutiny against the Apostle Paul. His character was blasted. His name was slandered. They winked at incest. They abused their marriages. They failed to give as they should. They questioned the resurrection. What a church. What an incredible church. And Paul loved this church. And he heard about these things. And so he writes a letter back to them. It's actually the second letter to Corinthians. We don't have it. We have the third letter. We have the first and the third letter of Corinthians. We don't have the second one. We see 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, but there's one in the middle that is lost to history. I tend to wonder or speculate why. I wonder what Paul said in that letter. It must have been harsh. And they were pretty angry with him. And so he goes, I'm going to make a short, long story as short as I can. Uh, He goes to Ephesus. He's away from them. He goes to Ephesus. And you know, wherever Paul goes, trouble is not far behind, right? I mean, everything was fine until Paul arrives. And then riots and problems and everybody's going crazy. He's in Ephesus preaching the gospel. This massive riot ensues. He almost dies. He probably should have died, but somehow he escapes out of Ephesus. And he goes to Troas, he, he escapes to Troas and God just opens this door and he preaches the gospel and people are being saved and the church is starting and it's growing. But in the midst of this open door that God has given to him, he says that my spirit, it had no rest. He was still conflicted by the church at Corinth and the fact that, that Titus never came. He never brought back news. He doesn't know. It's not like you can Skype these guys. It's not like we've got Facebook or texting. He had no idea what was going on in Corinth. And he loved these people. And and Titus doesn't show up. So he's heartbroken. God's working in Troas. But it says that he took his leave from there. It doesn't say that God told him to leave. It doesn't say God said, go ahead and go to Macedonia. He just left. I'm not saying he stepped out of God's will, but he certainly was in trouble spiritually. And so he sits down and he writes 2 Corinthians, or what we would say 3 Corinthians. And the problem with this whole suffering that he's going through is, and he even said, he said, you know, all of the hardship All of the anguish, all of the persecution that I've gone through pales in comparison to what I think about you guys because my heart breaks for you. He says this in 2 Corinthians 11. This is sort of a laundry list of everything that Paul went through. He says, with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings and often near death, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Jesus only had to go through that once. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, in danger from robbers, in danger from my own people, in danger from the Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the wilderness, in danger at sea, danger from false brothers. You get the idea here that Paul was constantly in danger. In toils and hardships, through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from the other things, there is the daily pressure on me of the anxiety I have for all of the churches. What tops it all is what I think about you guys because I care for you. And when I see what's going on, it breaks my heart. And Paul is a man ready to quit He's like, God, this is too much. It's too hard. I preach your word. All I get is trouble and people hate me. I just want to walk away. So he goes to Macedonia. And what does he do next? He writes this down. He says, when I came to Troas uh, to preach the gospel, even the door was open for me in the Lord. My spirit was was not at rest because I did not find my brother Titus 
So I took leave of them and went to Macedonia. That's what we're reading. But what does the next verse say? Well, we'll see that in a minute. But I think what I'm saying is that Paul had what I'm calling a Habakkuk moment. Paul saw how bad it was and he was ready to just jump off the cliff. But it's like the spirit of God just washed over him. And I love what Habakkuk says at the end of this book. He says this, though the fig tree does not bud, and there's no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. Habakkuk understood. All hell can break loose. Everything can go the other way, but I've got God on my side. And for us, we have Jesus Christ in our heart. And Paul knew this, and Paul saw how hard it was, but instead of looking at his circumstances, he started looking at his standing in Jesus Christ. He reflected on who he is in Christ. And now we'll begin to see the tide change. And it's a beautiful, powerful passage. In verse 14, he says this, but thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphant procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. Now, to look at that passage on the surface doesn't seem like that big of a deal. This is huge. The word triumphal procession is such a beautiful and uh, powerful statement. He says that God, through Jesus Christ, always leads us in a sense, in overwhelming victory. This word triumph, it's a Roman word. It's something that the emperor would allow to happen maybe once in a lifetime to one of his generals. And there were so many specifications that had to happen in order for the emperor to allow a triumph to happen. So let me explain this. A, a triumph basically was this massive parade. They shut down all of Rome and everybody was there and this beautiful procession through the streets of Rome to celebrate this incredible victory. But how do you get a triumph? How do you qualify to get a triumph? Well, I'm glad you asked. Here's what has to happen. Only a general in highest standing could ever be paid this incredible uh, gift. Before any Roman general could be granted a triumph, he must achieve certain things. He must actually be the commander in chief in the field and not some secondary leader. He would have to, you know, do his job for years. And the battle that they fought must have ended the war. The final decisive battle. War is over. The boys are coming home. They're going to see their family. It's over. You guys have won the war because of this battle. And in this particular battle, at least 5,000 enemy troops would have had to have been killed. Pretty gory, isn't it? So that it actually fell into the category of a slaughter. You guys slaughtered these guys. You totally destroyed the enemy. And the Roman territory would have to have been increased by this action. And if these requirements are met, if this hooper, hyper, incredible victory was gained, then the emperor would declare a triumph. And there would be this processional, what an incredible picture. Here's what it looked like, okay? Imagine, you know, a, a Rose Bowl parade on steroids. This is what's going on. All of the people are there. All of the temples are burning incense. All of the ladies are throwing, you know, rose petals on the street. It's a place with smells and bells. It's incredible. And the first people to come down the road would be, of course, 
the politicians. Senators would be down there first shaking hands and probably passing out pamphlets. I'm not sure, but they would be the first ones going down the street. Then came the trumpeteers. They'd be blowing their trumpets, heralding this incredible victory and what was coming. Next, after the trumpeteers, then all of these carts laden with spoils of war. You know, armor and swords and food and raiment and gold and silver just all over the place. Let us show you what we did in this victory. And then after that, artists would be commissioned and the artists would have had to paint these big pictures that would have been on banners of the battle that they just won. On top of that, there would be floats. People on these floats would be acting out, you know, the battle that had just taken place. It was a big deal. After this, then came the, uh, the white bull, which would be sacrificed at the end of this parade. And then, after the bull, came all of the prisoners of war, chained, walking to their death. At the end of the parade, they would either be executed or thrown to the lions or made to fight in a gladiatorial fight. They were in trouble. They were not happy about this at all. Behind them were the lictors. The lictors would be beating them as they went. Crazy scene. After the lictors, then come the musicians. Musicians are playing this celebratory music. Everybody is celebrating what's going on, followed by the priests. The priests are swinging their incense back and forth. People are throwing their rose petals. Everybody else is burning incense. The smell would have been everywhere. The smell of victory. And they all could smell this. After the priests went by, then the women uh, would be tossing their flowers and then came the general himself riding on this chariot with four white horses. Some servant is behind him holding a crown over his head. I don't know why he doesn't just put it on his head, but he's holding it over his head as he goes through the crowd. And at the end of that, then the soldiers who fought the battle would be coming, waving to everybody, yelling, triumph, triumph, triumph. And this celebration would be going on and this party would start like New Orleans has never seen. And this, this is the picture that Paul is painting for those of us who are in Jesus Christ, no doubt he had seen a triumph. And he's saying, even in the midst of this difficulty, even though I'm so close to just chucking it all, even though I'm hurting deeply, yet I know who I am. He leads me always in this triumph. Who I am in Jesus is I am a conqueror. I am more than that. I have defeated everything in my way and I have been declared righteous in front of him and I can celebrate that. That's pretty awesome to me that that's what picture Paul is trying to paint. One guy wrote this. He said, no matter what, you may be, what may be going wrong, no matter how disappointing, discouraging, depressing, how difficult it might be, how your heart breaks and grieves, you are privileged to be marching among the ranks of those who serve the sovereign Lord. And believe me, he is in control of every detail and he will triumph. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It should be enough for us to belong to the troops of the commander of all commanders, to have been chosen by God to be a soldier of Jesus Christ, to wear his uniform, to bear his name, to serve his cause. That should be enough. Just the contemplation of the privilege of being associated with Jesus Christ should bring back the joy. 
Thank you, God, that I will triumph because Christ always triumphs. And so Paul understood that he was an overcomer. And an overcomer is grateful for the privilege of being included. But thanks be to God who in Christ always includes us, always leads us. You are following a conquering hero in a victory parade, not as a captive, but as a conqueror. And that smell that you smell is the victory that Jesus Christ has performed on our behalf. And so to me, to know who I am, it brings me joy to know that Jesus Christ has said, I want to include you in this that part of his sovereign plan was to pluck me out. That's incredible to me. And somebody who is an overcomer is a person who understands that privilege. Next, I would say that the overcomer is grateful for the promise of certain victory. He goes on and, 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 and the verse continues. It says, but thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, that we know as believers that eventually, and even today, the victory has been won. Did you know that Paul wrote 2 Corinthians really close to the same time that he wrote Romans? They're within months of each other. These two great epistles. And Romans chapter eight is like one of the greatest chapters in all of scripture. And in this particular passage, I think he alludes again to this. So if you want to go to Romans 8, you can. And I want to just read through this and just say a few things as we move on. But Paul says this. He says, after really in, in the first part of Romans 8, developing the gospel, it says, there is uh, therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Those who know him, it's an amazing thought that we are not condemned. And he starts off by saying, what then shall we say to these things, to the gospel? What do you say to the gospel? Do you know what I say to the gospel? Wow. <laughs> That's pretty amazing when you think about it. We sing about the cross and about what he's done for us. And it is an incredible thought that God would rescue me. He says, if God is for us, oh, I'm sorry, I got a little ahead of myself. If God is for us, who can be against us? That's a question. It's not a statement. So what's the answer? Nobody, nothing. God isn't against you. He even says it, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with his gracious, will, will with him graciously give us all things? There is no condemnation for those who've been called. And what the gospel does is it gives us a free gift, even though we were guilty. Even though we deserved death and hell and, and this punishment, God, who is rich in mercy, instead of holding it against us, he held it against his son. And he goes on and he says, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. And then he says, Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. So get this picture in your head. Imagine a courtroom. God is on his throne. He is the judge. We are in that room and we are being accused by the prosecuting attorney who is saying, these guys are guilty. Do you see what they've done? And he would name off all of our sins. And Jesus, our defense attorney, would have to give his case. And when he stands, he doesn't say a word. He just does this. You see that? You see that? You see this? You see that? Um, your honor, I would submit to you that somebody else has been punished on their behalf. And it's me. 
And all of their sins are absolved because I paid that price. And God the Father, the judge, brings the gavel down and says, case dismissed. These people are found not to be guilty because of what he has done for us. We have been set free. What shall we say to these things? Amen. Wow. Hallelujah. Amen. I love this story in, in World War II. There was a pastor in uh, the Netherlands who was protecting the Jews, was, was hiding the Jews. And, you know, it's difficult to do that. And they were found out. And one night he and his family were rounded up and thrown into the cattle cars that you've seen. And, and they'd heard enough of the stories. They knew where they were going. They were going to a concentration camp. They would be separated. They would die awful deaths, starvation or being shot or gassed. They knew what was coming. And all night long, this family rode together in silence. And the train finally stopped in the morning and they hear those boots walking towards the door and the doors are opened. And they're expecting to be opened into Germany but instead they're opened to Switzerland. They're opened not to a concentration camp, but to freedom. Because somebody at the middle of the night while that train was going, turned a switch, moving them out of condemnation into salvation. And the pastor couldn't help but just repeat over and over and over again, what do you do with such a gift? What do you do with such a gift? What do you do with such a gift? You say, wow, that's incredible that I have this gift and so I will never be separated. It says, who shall separate us then from the love of Christ? If this is true, if this is who our standing is in, it's in Jesus and what he's done for us, then tell me if any of those things can separate you. What can come into your life that would separate you from the love of God that will be eternal, that you will see someday? The answer is nothing, but let's go through them. Shall tribulation, and the word for tribulation is really a word that is pressure from the outside in. Can anything pressing on you from the outside separate you from the love of God? No, no. Uh, there was a man by the name of William Beebe uh, and his assistant was Otis Barton. And they wanted so desperately to find out what was under the sea, what was way down deep. But you know, being human, they couldn't go that deep because the ocean's deep and the deeper you go, the more pressure builds and they would be killed if they went down deep. So they built this thing. It's called a biosphere. It was just this massive round structure, really thick walls. And they put a window in it that was incredibly thick. I don't even know what substance they used, but they could see through it. And they went into the ocean. And they went down, down, deep into the ocean. They finally reached 3,028 feet. Incredible for that time. And they shined a light outside. And do you know what they saw? They saw delicate little fishies swimming around. And they thought to themselves, how do these delicate creatures survive the pressure of the ocean? Well, they found out, and I'm not a zoologist, but um, I'll just throw this out, that the pressure inside of these little creatures was greater than the pressure that came in against them. And you who are in Christ, can I just share a verse? It says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Who we have, the spirit of God says nothing, not tribulations. Well, what about distress? What about things that aren't from the outside in, but the inside out? There are some of you you are your worst enemy, right? What your mind conceives is the worst thing about you. 
You think about who you are, your past, or things that have happened to you in the past that somehow has created something inside of you, and this distresses you. This is something that comes from the outside, from the inside out. And God says to people like the Apostle Paul, you know, I work best with broken vessels. I work best with those who aren't so full of themselves so that the treasure can spill out of you. I really am okay with you being broken. And it's okay to allow your hurts to make something out of you that I can make beautiful. You know, the guy that uh, wrote the song that is sung or played at most graduations, Pomp and Circumstance, his name was Malcolm Sargent. And Malcolm Sargent was um, at an opera one night and this one woman got up to sing And she was young and beautiful and she sang this piece that was just flawless. And the person that was with him said, what did you think of her song? And he said, oh, she will be brilliant when something breaks her heart. She can get all the tunes right right now, but you know what she really needs? Pain. She needs something to break her heart so that she can sing with pathos, so she can really feel. And I think it was Tozer that said uh, that, that, that God, in order to use somebody greatly, he must hurt them deeply. And that doesn't sound very loving, but he certainly allowed that to happen to Paul. But it can't separate you. The pain that's inside of you can't separate you. James said, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face many kinds of trials because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. So tribulation can't, distress can't, persecution. Now this is where we step off the page because you have no idea and I have no idea and it goes down. Persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword, something the American church has no idea about yet. But let me tell you something in the light so that you can believe it when the darkness comes because it's coming. These words may mean nothing to you right now, but the way I see the world, I'm telling you, American Christians, it's coming quicker than you think. But Jesus says to us right now in the light that persecution can't separate you from the love of Christ. That famine and nakedness and danger and sword, it can't do it. I don't know what's coming, but we must be prepared because this may give us our greatest voice. Joseph Tan was a pastor in Romania. And before he became a pastor, he snuck out of Romania and he went to college, a Christian college. Wanted to bring the gospel back to Romania in the 80s. Trichescu, danger, communism. And he told his friends at college, I'm going back to Romania. I'm bringing the gospel back to Romania. And one of the persons, one of the students asked him, Joseph, what chances do you have for successfully implementing your plans? And he said, well, I don't know. But he asked God. And he said, God brought to mind this verse, Matthew 10, 16. I send you as sheep in the midst of wolves. And he goes on and he says, it seemed to me that God said, tell me, what chance does a sheep surrounded by wolves have of surviving five minutes, let alone of converting the wolves? Joseph, that's how I send you. Totally defenseless and without reasonable hope of success. If you're willing to go like a sheep among wolves, then so I send you. And he went. And after his return, he preached uninhibitedly the gospel of Jesus, and he suffered greatly for it. And the communists came up to him and they said, Joseph, if you keep preaching, we will kill you. 
And Joseph's response was great. He said, listen, your greatest weapon is to kill me. My greatest weapon is to die. Because if you kill me, everybody will know why. You see, all these tapes that I'm doing, all these people are going to know why I died, and it will spread like wildfire. So it's up to you. <laughs> what do you want to do? He's still preaching today because even persecution can't stop that. Even though it's coming, and even though Paul was writing to a group of people that it was happening for right now, he even says, that is, as it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. When Paul wrote this, it was dangerous, but it was going to get worse. Nero was beginning his reign. One man wrote this. When Paul wrote this, neither he nor the Romans nor the Corinthians could know how short a time would elapse before they would stand in need of this very comforting truth. Paul himself would be killed by a sword, a Roman sword, and his readers were men and women whose blood would soak the sands of the Roman amphitheaters under the massive persecution. But the honor of Christ was safe in their keeping because they were safe in his love and he would never let them go and he would never give them, uh, he would always give them the courage and the strength to endure and to persevere. They didn't need to fear to die. They didn't need to fear being mauled by wild beasts. They didn't need to fear being soaked in tar and then told to deny Christ or they would die by being lit as torches in the gardens of the emperor. They didn't need to fear fighting with gladiators. They didn't need to fear fighting wild beasts or they didn't need to fear the conflict with hell's demons. They were safe in the undying love of Christ. And this is true. It's true today. It's true for those Christians in uh, Iraq and Iran and North, Car North, North Carolina, <laughs> North Korea, North Carolina too. Uh, it's, it's true. Wherever the persecution is, God is there. He doesn't leave them. He doesn't separate himself from us. He won't. None of those things will happen. And he answers his question by an emphatic no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. That word, more than conquerors, it's actually one word. It's not uh, Nikea, it is Hooper Nikea. To gain, listen, a surpassing victory. To gain an overwhelming victory. Like a general in a battle that's overwhelming. It's a slaughter. We totally killed you guys. So we have been invited to walk with him in triumphal procession, not because of what we've done, but because of what he has done. That's amazing to me. And so he says this, for I am sure, I am persuaded, I am confident that neither death nor life, nor angels, the good ones, or rulers, demons, the bad one, nor things present right now, or things to come, what's future, nor power, nor height, the highest of heights, nor depth, the lowest of lows, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. That's amazing to me. He's not going to let you go. Whatever you're dealing with, if you're walking with him, you're safe. That's such good news. There's a hymn, an old hymn called How Firm a Foundation. And you have to look far, but on the very seventh verse, can you believe that? They've got seven verses in hymns. It says this, the soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose will not I will not, I cannot desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never 
forsake. That's good news. We walk in triumph with him. And here's a kind of an added benefit, and that is this, that an overcomer is grateful just for the part that they play. This is so amazing to me, is that we've been invited to march in this incredible, triumphant procession, and we bring nothing, nothing to the game. Uh, I'm a big Chicago Bulls fan, or I used to be when they were a team back in the 90s, and they won championships, and Michael Jordan was the man. Oh, there's one game, it's so good, one game where Michael Jordan scored 69 points, and one of his teammates, a guy by the name of Stacy King, he hit the front end of a one-on-one. -on -one. He scored one point in the game. He was interviewed afterwards. Stacy King was interviewed afterwards, and he said, it is so awesome that Michael Jordan and I combined to score 70 points. <laughs> that is so good. That's how I feel. I, do, I don't bring anything to the game. There is nothing good in me except Jesus Christ and what he's done in me. And so my goal is just to lift his name up on high, and it says, and through through us, he spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. So if that's the case, then in this processional, who are we? What part do we play? Who is the one that spread the aroma? It's the priests. The priests, the smoking pot that spread the aroma. Were they in the fight? Did they battle? They did nothing. They just showed up and they get to burn things and smell good. Woohoo! This is awesome. This is me. This is you. We've done nothing to earn our salvation. You're not good enough. You're not skilled enough. You're not religious enough. But Jesus has invited us to make much of him. And that's what we get to do. And how amazing it is that we get to do that. How you doing, church? You know this is true. Nothing can separate you. Know that right now so that when it all goes south, you'll understand that. When you lose your house because of Jesus, when you can't eat because of Jesus, when you're forced to starve because of him, when you lose your very life, when you're in danger because of your faith, remember it. I pray it doesn't happen. I'm not trying to be a prophet of doom, but I think we need to really Think about it. But nothing will separate us. And what he said to us is now just celebrate the fact that you lead this processional. Let me close with this. A guy by the name of uh, Dr. William E. Sangster. In the 20th century in England, he was an evangelist, an author, a conference speaker, a very godly, godly, godly man. And what he wanted to do with his life was to make much of Jesus. He wanted to preach the word. He wanted to go anywhere he could to tell people about Jesus. And people came to hear him. And one day he felt this pain in his throat and this numbness in one of his legs. And he thought, oh no, something's wrong. But he didn't want to get it checked out. He just continued to go. But finally it became so bad that he went to a doctor and they found that he had this this atrophy in the body that was basically going to shut him down. Eventually, his muscles would stop working. Eventually, his voice would be gone. He wouldn't be able to swallow. And sure enough, over time, that all came to pass. But he could still write. And even though he couldn't preach, even though he couldn't speak, he wrote the best he could about Jesus Christ. And one Easter morning, he writes this to his daughter. On Easter morning, he said, it is terrible to wake up on Easter morning and have no voice with which to shout, he is risen. But it would be still more terrible to have a voice and not want to shout. Anybody got a voice? He is risen. He's given us his spirit. We walk in triumphal procession with him. Let's not stop talking about it. Let's start spreading the news. 
because that's who we are in Christ. Mm -hmm.